All right, so thanks for being there. Um, uh, this this lecture should, uh, I think, well, I didn't time it, uh, but I, I think it will fit in maybe 30, 40 minutes, I hope. And uh, feel free to ask any question, whatever you want. Uh, that's the purpose of it. Um, yeah, so it, it will uh, not be too much about uh, finite elements, although I will, I will spend probably two minutes uh, just to give an extremely overall ID of the terms that are used, like what is a test function, but but may, mainly it's uh, about solving a static thermal and electrostatic problem. And then we should end up with something actually more useful, like computing a capacitance um, with the electrostatic problem. But so we'll start very simple with static thermal. And I would like to to thank, uh, yeah, the, the the support of the Academy of Finland grant and Tampere University for all the development in in the last uh, year and a half that allowed to well to to add a lot of features. This is very basic things we're going to discuss today because it's the first part of the lecture. But uh, well, as you will see, for example, computing the capacitance um, requires actually uh, some more um, advanced uh, tools. Um, and, and this has been added uh, three months ago. This all funded by the Academy of Finland project. So, uh, so um, the first step is uh, you need for this, you'll need sparse lizard and gmesh. So the sparse lizard is the C++ library that will allow you to um, to write your C++ script kind of uh, thing to, to describe your simulation, like uh, boundary condition, equations, uh, solve, like you know, linear iteration, things like this all happens in sparse desert. And then um, Gmesh is, uh, well, you don't have to use only Gmesh, but Gmesh is basically uh, the best measure that you can use in sparse desert. And we will see where to download it. Um, and we will use it to mesh the geometry here. The geometry will be very simple in this case, but you can you can mesh, uh, create very advanced and import very advanced geometries in Gmesh. Then you can mesh them with high quality uh, elements. That's what Gmesh does. And, and then from there on, we uh, will use either Paraview or Gmesh for visualizing the output. So there is no graphical part to Sparse Lizard. It's done with uh, um, Gmesh and Paraview. All good to start? Can I have a... Uh, any word from the audience? Because it feels like a desert. Yeah. Hello. All right. So, um, so we will use. So you, you can you can compile sparse lizard, and this is uh, all described on the on the website for Windows and Mac. It was successfully tested, but on Linux. Um, you you can actually get a static library. So for that. You go on sparsezer.org, and then you go in the download section, and then you have all the like how to do things. But if you go to the Linux part, you can actually download the static library here. Um, and so this doesn't require any compiling. And then you, once you have downloaded it, you just have to copy paste this command, and then it should, uh, at least on Fedora and Ubuntu, it should just compile your script, and that's it. So this uh, will give you the fastest thing without any issues on Linux, at least. For the rest, please refer to how to install it. But Linux, anyways, is recommended. So, And then Gmesh, you can uh, download it either as an API, which you can link to as far as Lizard, but that's more advanced. We will not talk about that today. Or um, you can just download the binary, um, which you will find on gmesh.info. And then... Uh, you can download it from here, the Linux version, for example. All right. Um, yeah, I, I have already downloaded stuff. Um, I have Gmesh already on my laptop, so I will not do that part. But you can see Gmesh allows to import very complex geometries and mesh complex stuff. It's actually the leading open source meshing software. Um, so that being said, I have already downloaded it here. 
the, the static library for sparse so gmesh is just available on my laptop it's uh it's just available so that's we're not going to talk more about that part uh, when you have this you can just extract it here and then uh well, i have prepared some geometry file to save some time but you will get a folder like this with examples and more things um but let's come back to the slides and let's first explain a bit the math about uh, what we're going to solve first so that's the heat equation so if you have a, a thermal problem um so well you have a field t which is the temperature field in kelvins um and then you have the conductivity which um yeah in watts per meter kelvin and then you also have uh, more transient related things uh, the heat capacity and uh, the density and then the, you obtain the the equation in the first equation um basically which is the heat equation in time um so what you see um we can analyze a little bit this equation what you see is that on the right side you have the divergence of this kappa gradient of t so the kappa gradient of t to a sign it's actually the heat flux and so if you are in not in the time domain, if you're a static case, then basically what the heat equation says is the second equation. Uh, basically, it says that the divergence of the heat flux is zero. So you cannot have, um, well, energy created. Now it's not always zero. You can have uh, sources, for example, current flow, which is, can create a local uh, heat source, and then you don't have equal to zero then the divergence of the flux, they can be a divergence and it's directly related to how much uh, uh, well, heat is generated by current flow, for example. But if you don't have sources, then basically you cannot create energy and you have the divergence of, of the flux that is zero. And if you're not in the, if you're in the uh, not static case, then you can have, uh, well, accumulated, uh, well, you can have a total heat coming in in a, in a given volume and, and if that happens then you have a temperature increase of that uh, volume this is then equal to the rho cp dt over t um but that's very classical things um so is there any question until now no all right otherwise feel free to feel free to interrupt me oh all right so um so th this is a what is called the strong form of the heating as such uh where you cannot really do so much about it it tells you like what the t field should follow at any point in space but to solve it on a computer you need uh to discretize it and for that um well there are many techniques but what we're going to use is uh a finite element um and we're going to discretize it in the following way below so we will just take the integral on a whole um, on the whole well, geometry. So, for example, the square that we will consider later, and we will multiply that strong form by what is called the test function. So that's t prime. Maybe I can have a micro finite element introduction on this aspect. So basically. And this is more the electrostatic case, but just to have a one minute overview, um, your fields, um, your temperature field, it's a continuous beast, but to discretize it, you will actually rewrite it as a sum of some unknown coefficient C times what is called a shape function N. And you will have a number of unknowns equal to the number of C coefficients you have. So in this case, M. And so these shape functions, they can be a lot of types of shape functions, but um, the typical uh, Lagrange shape functions at order one in 1D are uh, this kind of piece. So this would be the shape function associated to uh, node I. And basically, if you have your um, coefficient C here, um, if you know them, then you can recreate a discretized approximation, well, a piecewise linear approximation of your solution based on these shape functions times their local uh, temperature value in our case, plus the temperature value at the next node times its own shape function. And, and if you sum all this together, you will actually get 
a linear interpolation of your solution on the elements uh, of, of the mesh. So what is here, you have um, in, in this 1D case, you have one, two, three, four, five edges. So that would constitute um, the, the mesh of your problem. So you have discretized your actual um, 1D problem into a number of mesh elements. And you have here in this case, six nodes. So you would have six degrees of freedom associated to that. So that's six unnodes. And so, um, so you have six unknowns and you need therefore six equations to get, uh, well, to be able to solve it in an AX equal B algebraic form as described on, on A4. Uh, and for that, you, well, you have to get somehow six equations. And for that, basically you will multiply. Um, so it, it, you will take your, the formulation that I will just show in the, in the coming slide. You will just multiply your strong form integrated over the whole omega by a test function. And every test function is this kind of guy. And by multiplying something by this test function and integrating over omega, actually, it means you just have to integrate over a very compact zone because the shape function, the test function has a very local support and it's zero everywhere else. And by multiplying by this test function for every test function, so one for every node here, every multiplication by test function and integrating on the whole domain um, will give you one equation. And then you will end up with a problem of type, like a, a matrix of six by six times all your unknown coefficient C equals some right hand side. You solve that, you have your C's. And then from the C's, you can sum all the C's multiplied by their shape function and you have the solution field T. So that's in a nutshell, what is what the basic principle of finite elements, but, but the purpose here is not to actually describe how finite element works. It's just to give you an idea of what is a test function, what is a shape function, and what is this uh, strange uh, T prime um, symbol. But for that, I, I can only recommend to, to check out online there probably thousands of uh, um, things explaining um, how how finite uh, how finite element works at, at its uh, basics. So as we said, um, we don't solve for the strong form. We discretize our unknown field T, our temperature field here, and then we multiply by a test function T to actually get uh, all the equations we need. And so this is actually totally True, this is actually just pure math to go from the center to the last equation. If you have the center equation, then you also have the last equation. You just integrate on the whole domain omega uh, and you multiply by some valid test function. And then you still have zero because the central equation holds. And, and this is something close to um, what we want to use to um, solve our problem, but not fully. So next slide, I just recall the weak formulation that was in the previous slide. So yeah, so the, the first line, it's the weak formulation of the, the, the last line in this slide. That's what we call the weak formulation of the strong formulation. That is, so the strong formulation is the middle equation and the weak formulation is the bottom equation. Now, it, it is a weak formulation, but we can do better because this involves a second space derivative on T. Um, and, and for example, if you want to use uh, in 1D, um, a linear, uh, a piecewise linear approximation of T, since you have a second order space derivative, you will get just zero equals zero everywhere. You cannot even use linear, piecewise linear shape functions. So it's quite limiting to have a second order um, space derivative. That's one thing. Um, you can do better, but, but also um, if you want to interact with your uh, geometry to set boundary conditions, you definitely can do better because as you can see on the bottom line, you can just rewrite it um, by using some math. So if you remember the general, the integration by parts that you probably saw in secondary school, when you had something with a derivative times something else, you can actually rewrite it as an integral of that something times the something else that now gets the derivative. So the derivative is shifted to the other term and you have some, um, some lower order integration, which, well, 
in what the would just be some difference of two values. That's how you might remember generalized uh, integration by parts. But the generalized integration by parts, if we can call it like this, will tell you that the first equation can be rewritten. That's uh, absolutely mathematically correct. Um, it can be rewritten as the second line. So there you have shifted the, the space derivative to the test function, and you have made appear um, a boundary term, which includes a, a normal derivative of t on the boundary. So with the boundary, uh, if you have the, the omega domain below, which is the domain on which you want to study your thermal or heat equation, the boundary, it's, it's the whole boundary around. And as, as you can see, this allows you to provide a, actually a nice way to, to provide um, boundary conditions. Because if we would just consider the first equation, the only way you can have boundary condition, or the only way you can really interact with it is by forcing a temperature at one place and another temperature at another place. But now with the actual weak form of the that is below, you can also set uh, the value of the normal derivative on the boundary. So you actually can set how much uh, heat flux is entering from the sides. And this is actually quite powerful. This is what we will use. And this is what is classically used. So that was for the heat equation. We will now move to, um, well, setting it up in sparse lizard and play a bit with the terms. And then we will do the same for the electrostatic case with the last two slides. So um, I can close this. I had extracted this here. I can open a terminal in the folder. And then um, I have my quad.geo file. I have a main file. And this is the two things I will need. These geo files I don't need. There are lots of examples in the examples folder. Uh, this is the static library, actually, and this is all the headers that you need, the projects. So we can open the main, and I can make it probably more readable by increasing the text size. And we can also open the quad.geo file. So the quad.geo, it's a, it's, it's a very easy way to describe your geometry uh, with the .geo. It's a GMesh format. Now, this is not the only way, uh, of course, you can um, like create a geometry. There are many other ways, like GMesh allows to import more classical or, or industrial formats like step files and things like this. But for now, this will be more than enough. So we can open this with GMesh. And then what we see is, is uh, a square, like hence the name quad.geo. Uh, a square with four nodes, four lines, and one surface. So I'm not going to go in details on the GMesh format, but basically you define, and again, there are many ways to do it. You can also you do it with shapes and Boolean operations in later and more recent GMesh versions. But you describe your point position and uh, the mesh size you want at these points, the lines, and then surfaces, and then you have to give a tag to to the elements because, um, well, you want to treat some parts of the meshes differently than others, for example, because it's different material properties. So you have to have one unique integer tag on every element to be able to identify it. And this is what you do with physical regions. So you can have, in this case, physical surfaces, which will be the whole, uh, the whole surface. And then you have the left line, which is a physical line, and the right line. So this we can visualize here. We can first click on mesh in 2D. You get a mesh. I can change the color of it. So you might be able to see uh, it better. So yeah, you get your Deloney mesh with triangles. And you can go to tools visibility. And there you will see uh, which physical regions you have. So you have uh, the surface, which is everything. And then you have the left line, which has tag two, and then the right line, which has tag three. All right. Now, um, yes. So if you want to define physical regions, you have to uh, 
list all the entities that are part of this physical region. And these ones you can get um, easily by double clicking uh, all mesh options. Then you can go to geometry, visibility, and then you can show the line levels and the surface level. So you, you, you know what you have to pick um, in the list to create your physical regions. But again, there are many ways to do it. This is just one way. So we're going to do a 2D mesh. Um, and again, you, you have a lot of options in Gmesh. If you want to have quads, then you can ask it to recom recombine it, for example, and, and things like this. But let's keep it simple for now. I have my 2D mesh. I save it. Um, well, you can you have different types of uh, mesh forward in Gmesh, but uh, maybe the, the most safe way so that Sparsos can always load it is to go to File, Export, uh, and then you export as your quad.mesh so you're sure to get the format you want uh, and then you export to version 2 ascii then it will be loadable natively by sparse lizard otherwise you have to use gmesh api for example now we can check the the quad.mesh file that was created and we can check that all our physical regions are still there Yes, left and right, it's all there. We're ready to go. So now we can move to the main file, which there was already an example, but let's remove it. And we will use this quad.mesh file that has been created. Um, so let's go. Um, we have a, a, temp, a heat equation problem. Uh, we can first, um, for simplicity, add numbers uh, add, add names to the, the physical region tag. So we had sur the, the whole surface was one, left was number two, and right was number three. That's the, otherwise we have to work with numbers. That's less convenient. That's just a trick to have names associated to the number. And then we want to load the mesh, which was quad.mesh. So there we have the mesh loaded. Uh, what else do we need? we need to define the temperature field. So that's a field. And, and then you're going to, you have access to different types of shape functions. So if you want to have the X coordinate, you use X, Y coordinate, Y. Uh, and then you have uh, also H curl shape functions. We would probably talk about it in later parts, but you also have H1, X, Y, Z, if you want to, to solve for mechanics. But basically this is, you can consider this is, the usual nodal shape functions for scalar fields. And this is exactly what uh, the temperature field needs. It's uh, continuous. Uh, it can just use H1 shape functions. What else? Um, well, in finite elements, you have an, we, we talked about this piecewise linear approximation, but it doesn't have to be piecewise linear. It can be a piecewise quadratic polynomial to approximate the field or cubic or anything else. So there is no limitation on that in sparse lizard. So we can do a set, you, you have to set the order of the field on all the regions you're gonna use because uh, sparse lizard cannot guess it for you. Um, it's pretty good in practice to have order two so that you have a second order polynomial approximation because piecewise linear, it's quite a rough approximation. All right, so, um, that's about it for the order. Now, um, if we come back to the equations, um, you can see that basically what you have is gradient T, gradient T. So um, in, in that sense, if you don't have uh, the right term, any T field plus uh, a constant value is a solution. So you have to set uh, the value of the temperature field somewhere because otherwise it's floating. You have to reference it at least at some point. Uh, you always have to do this in, in, in this situation, but uh, in our case, uh, it will just appear naturally because uh, we will use uh, zero Kelvin on the right side uh, of the um, of the of the geometry. So we will set a constraint. So we will basically we will force the field T on the right side to zero. Now, 
I, I mentioned it was Kelvin's the unit, but actually it's all floating. So you could consider that it's uh, it's Celsius. Um, so in this case, Kelvin's or Celsius doesn't matter. We can work with Celsius because the temperature field is floating. So we can say that it's zero Celsius on the right side. And then to have some something happening, we can also force the temperature field on the left side to uh, 20 Celsius. All right. So that's all for the field setup. So you have set a boundary condition uh, that is Dirichlet condition. That's when you force the field to a value, then it's called Dirichlet boundary condition. And we will also work with the alternative, which is Neumann boundary conditions just after. And then for that, we will use this uh, extra term that appeared on the right side of the bottom equation. But let's start with a very simple uh, situation. So now that we have this, we have to describe the equations. So we define the formulation term. So heat equation, heat equation, which I can call HE will be shorter or HEQ, HEQ. Now, um, how it works is that you will add integration terms to it. Um, and then all the sum of all these terms, so in this case, uh, one or two, will be equal to zero. So sparse hazard knows that all this has to be equal to zero after being summed. So you can add many plus equal integral terms, and then all this is equal to zero. So if we come back to, um, well, I could show them side by side. So we have our equations at hand. Um, yeah, so we will add the integration as uh, on the on the lower equation of the the slide that is visible. The integration of uh, on the whole region, so omega, which is uh, in our case it's sur the whole surface of uh, well minus k times the gradient of dot t. So t is our field. If we just put t then sparse hazard will consider the value as of t as it is at the moment of evaluation. But we actually, that's not what we want. We want to say that it's an, the unknown field. So we use dot for degree of freedom. And then we also have to multiply it by the gradient of the test function, which is tft. So by tft, it's transformed into an object that, that is the test function of t. All right, so this still is missing. Uh, K is unknown here, so you could define a parameter if you have different regions um, with a parameter object. Um, but in this, it's, this case, we're just going to make it simple. We will consider a constant um, uh, conductivity of, uh, let's say, 400. I think that's the value for aluminum. And yeah, uh, so there you're set, ready to go. Uh, you just have to solve the heat equation. Now you can solve in different ways, but uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it. So this assembles your AX equal B problem. So it assembles A, B, then it solves for X, and then it saves the value of the solution to all the fields that are in the formulation. So in this case, T. So now T is available. You can write T on everywhere, for example. And then we will write it to, we can we can write it to Paraview or or GMesh. Uh, I will start with uh, GMesh, and then maybe for the electrostatic part, we can write it in Paraview. So you get uh, you write it to a POS file, which is supported by GMesh, and then you say to what order uh, of accuracy you want to to write it. So which interpolation order of the shape functions? Uh, since you have a field of order two, you want to use order two probably. And then you can also do things like uh, well, you can get the the value or the, the max value um so you have a lot of post processing option where you can do t dot max uh you want the max on the surface region with some accuracy to compute the max and this will give you t max which you can then output t max is t max all right uh, now, with some luck, this uh, should compile immediately. And with more luck, I still have the copy-pasted 
Uh, no, I don't have any more. I have to recopy paste this, the compiling command. All right. So this should work. And today we're lucky. It just compiles immediately. And then uh, we just have to run it. So we run SLXE. Um, and then you get the answer here. Uh, wait, Tmax is 20, obviously, because we have set it to 20. And you know that the solution, because it's just heat flow from 20 degrees to zero degrees on a uniform material. So the solution is linearly decreasing from 20 to zero. And this is what we will see. Actually, I might want to uh, so save it in Paraview format um, because then we can also show cuts. So I will recompile it and, and run it again. Alex, what happened to the second term in the equation? So the second term, if you don't put anything, it basically means that the second term is all zero. So you have no heat flux coming in. And anyway, here um, on the boundaries, we apply a force T. So there is no more option to set anything because T is forced there. But we will see just in a minute, uh, we will stop putting a constraint on the T on left and we will put a heat flux source. So we will have a non-zero right term. And then you will see that uh, how yeah, how to use that right term. But if you don't put anything, then basically it's, it's zero. So have you put no Neumann on top and bo uh, bottom boundaries? Oh, that, I love these questions because I forgot to talk about this. Yeah, if you don't put anything on the on the top and bottom sides of the quad, we don't put anything. It means that you have Neumann. So Neumann is the right side uh, of the middle equation. It's this K, D, and T. Okay. Um, it means that you have Neumann zero. And, and what that means is that basically you have the normal derivative of T that is zero there. Okay. And so it's kind of, uh, there is no heat going there. Uh, mm -hmm. through the normal heat going through the surfaces if you don't put anything. So um, the, the flux will slide along these surfaces. Okay. All right, so now uh, I just changed the output format to VTU so we can use it, open it in Paraview, which is uh, already installed on my computer, but it's also just a, a binary that you can download uh, online and that's very straight. And then we can open that um, in Paraview um, and I can put Paraview on the top. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Uh, am I? Oh, I, I moved it to the bottom. That's definitely not what I wanted to do. Let's open it again. I put it on the top. No, it cannot do it. So I'll just minimize the other windows. All right, so uh, well, it requires to like a bit get used to PowerView, but basically you apply so you can see your field. And unsurprisingly, on the left, you have 20 Celsius and on the right, zero. And we can check that it's indeed a linear decrease from left to right by taking this plot over line. And we can say that uh, we want to follow the x-axis and then we apply and, well, no surprise, it's a linear decrease from the left to the right. We will we will do something more interesting than linear decreases, um, but that's the first thing we do. You could add uh, like uh, heat sources and then you would have a non-linear decrease. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for now. And, and you can do other things like checking surface uh, and you can see what is your mesh, uh, things like that. You can even probably, we could be no, uh, we cannot do it right now. You can we can plot the flux streamlines, but for now we have written we have written T. We might want to actually also show the flux. So for that it would be uh, minus uh, K times grad T. That's the the heat flux, and you write that on the surface um, in heat flux dot BTU at order two. So if we run this now. Um, then we can see the heat flux flowing. Um, so we can open the heat flux file. And by default, Paraview likes to show things in gray, but if you select heat flux, then, uh, well, it, it's constant everywhere, but you can plot streamlines. Probably if that's where we're taking big risks here to do things live. 
so we don't want too many streamlines and we want to have a seed line to plot the heat flux where is that part well yeah we want to have uh, all the lines going through all the streamlines going through this and unsurprisingly these streamlines but they will go from the, the the highest temperature to the lowest temperature um as you can see in blue uh they go from left to right uh this the heat just flows from left to right that, that's about it nothing special about that all right uh now um we can um we can remove this which was nice to show that you how you could do that kind of stuff but we can also now um use the neumann term to to see well what, what's going to be the effect of that guy so if we show again the equations here actually we could uh still force uh zero degrees on the right side of the quad but we could stop imposing it on the left for example and then if we do that um well i could leave the max uh printing because uh then we don't need to visualize every time if we don't so we just get the output of the max in the in the terminal so if we if we don't put on the left the 20 degrees uh condition then then we will obviously get um zero overall solution because it's fixed at zero on the right and there is no source so you will get uh, a max temperature and actually it's constant everywhere it's zero nothing interesting there but now we can um put a neumann source term so if we recall our equations uh but we we cannot put it in the same line because it doesn't apply to the same uh, region so we have to create a new time uh, so we're going to say that on the left line you have uh, this k normal derivative of t which by the way it's equal simply to the gradient of t times the normal um, we will just say that uh well we will write that neumann source term so let's remove this so on the left uh, we have then uh, k times the normal derivative of t so that will be our source so if we want to uh, so actually k times the normal derivative of derivative of t it's the normal heat flux coming on the left side so we we just use uh, any source for that so we could we could say that we want to have a source that is uh, purely in the x direction so we will put something and then zero for the y direction and we want to put uh, whatever one uh, it doesn't matter it's just for illustration then we will have uh, a source acting on the left side and and then uh it's so th this is this guy we have just uh, added um and then uh we still have to multiply by the test function so times tft and then this uh well the signs should be fine otherwise we might get negative temperatures in celsius compared to the reference but let's do this oh yes um Yeah, it's multiplied by, by by the normal basically. So there is a, it's a it's a scalar value. So we'll just put one. All right, and then uh, yeah, it's it's but it's just one. It doesn't really matter how much we put. I just want to illustrate that you can uh, use it use it as a source, and then uh, um, well, you get a non-zero temperature, and but still uh if we show the in para view the solution you will still get your linear decrease of temperature from the left to the right now the temperature is different because we haven't set it but we have just put a, a heat source coming through the line, and then the heat flux will still be going from the left to the right but so we have just used our first neumann boundary condition to well to to describe the problem so on the right we have zero forced Dirichlet condition and on the left we have not used the Dirichlet condition anymore we have used the Neumann boundary condition so that's a pretty nice uh, way 
to interact with the, your simulation and this is only possible because we have used this uh like generalized integration by parts all right now if if i if i don't put any term like this basically it's exactly identical to putting a zero here so it's exactly identical to having k dnt equal to zero so no heat flux flowing normally through the the boundary so that's it for the temperature part. Is there any question related to that? I could ask a question. Yes. Or it's like uh, making sure that I understand correctly. Um, so yes, that, I don't uh, hesitate to speak up. The second case, when you did minimum boundary condition, you already know uh, K, uh, the normal derivative of t that's known that's why you uh yeah like in this in this aspect you you're what you're really doing is you're forcing the the local heat flux at every point to a value that you already know yes so it's known it's already known that's yeah known. it's known yes okay absolutely yeah, um they, now they in practice the previous case that it's like you had in the lift not the normal yes the temperature you had the temperature itself which is 20. so exactly yes yeah now that's totally true and 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 it is useful in practice like uh, for example in dc current flow when you know your current density that's going to flow in your in your cable and you just put it like this but this is not always what we want to do sometimes you just know how much total energy is flowing through the line and not locally how much energy density there is uh, but this is fixed bit with, uh, with in the electrostatic case, we will actually use more useful quantities uh, as Neumann boundary conditions. So we will we will not impose the local charge density. We will impose the total charge that we want to put on an electrode. And then here it would correspond to imposing the total heat flowing through the left line. And, and this is kind of a quantity that you're supposed to know if, if you want to do a simulation like this. But, you always need to know some stuff about what you want to simulate, right? Yes, thank but, you. But then again, like uh, there are other cases when you do domain decomposition where you're just using that to actually link domains and then you, you're not always imposing a numerical value that you know. It's, it's a general purpose term, that Lyman uh, derivative term. In this case, it was just for a very simple illustration. Any other question? And I'll move to the electrostatic part otherwise. So uh, electrostatic, uh, why did I start with the heat equation? Because uh, I think it's, it's, it's everyone knows, like has a feeling about heat, uh, but uh, then electrostatic um, also, but maybe it's less, uh, uh, maybe a li little bit less intuitive for non-electrical engineers. Um, but so it's it's basically it's the same equation and we will first deduce it. You will see that it's it's, it's the same grad-grad equation. Um, and, and this is like, uh, there are lots of grad-grad equations like DC current flow, electrostatic heat equation and, and more. Um, but so it's a general form. And if you have understood this, you will easily understand the electrostatic equations now. So. Um, how do you get the electrostatic equation? Well, you always start from Maxwell's equation when it's about electromagnetics. And the Maxwell's equation are if, uh, well, tell me if there are mistakes, I apologize for that, but it should be fine overall. Um, so though that's it. So you have the divergence of your um, D equals to, to rho. Uh, so if you have, um, but for usual materials, your, um, D equals to epsilon times your electric field. And then you have the divergence of epsilon times the electric field equals to rho. This we will need just below. Um, so basically, if you have your electric field diverging in a, in a simple explanation, then it's because you have some charges in a, in a control uh, volume. Um, for the magnetic part, you have the divergence of B, which is equal to zero. So that's because uh, you never have uh, like magnetic monopoles. And I'm not going to describe all the equations, but I'm going to describe more the, the third equation um, because we need it to get the electrostatic 
thing uh, formulation. So if you have a curl of electric field, it's because you have a change in um, magnetic induction field over time. Now, in, in electrostatics, this is uh, the right term is zero because you're in electrostatics or you're at least uh, low enough frequency. The size of your problem is such that the D is zero. So electrostatic can be used not only for zero hertz, but you can actually use it even for like for MEMS devices. You can still use it at uh, at megahertz. Um, it's just a matter of uh, of like the the scale of what you're simulating, but in the actual zero hertz case, definitely the right term is zero, and so you have that uh, the curl of E, the electric field is equal to zero, and then that's just math. It means that E comes from a potential a scalar potential, so you can rewrite E as some constant times grad V, which is uh, usually we written that as minus grad V and then V is your electric potential in, in volts. That's the usual electric potential in your in your uh, in your socket at homes. Um, and so once you have this, then you can re-inject that in the first Maxwell equation. So you get that the divergence of so E was um, D was epsilon E. So the divergence of uh, epsilon E, so epsilon minus grad V is equal to rho. So if you rewrite that with the right, the minus sign on the right, you get the bottom equation. So that's again, it's the same as uh, if we call, recall the middle equation here, you had a, a divergence of K grad T. Now it became a divergence of epsilon grad V, and you have the charge density on the right side. Now, again, you can put it in a weak form. So you get the divergence of epsilon grad V, V prime, the omega, and then the, I have right to the left side, the charge density. Um, but, but then this, again, you can do better. And, and this will then make also appear this diamond term if you use the generalized integration by part in exactly the same way as uh, before, you get the, the bottom equation. So if I compare the two equations now, you had uh, integral on omega of k grad grad plus on the boundary k normal derivative of t times t. Uh, now it's it's very similar. It's uh, k became epsilon v became t became uh, uh, v, but it's the same. Um, and then you have this extra term here where you don't have to do any integration by part because there is no space derivative anyways. Uh, and this is the the source charge density. All right. So um, here um, in, in the simulation, you can interact with your problem by, again, by fixing the potential with the Dirichlet boundary condition or um, uh, playing with the Neumann term, or, um, or you can also just uh, like, also additionally impose a charge density if you know it. Uh, and then that's about it. So in this case, uh, I have a, a more interesting example um, where if we can do more interesting things, uh, our there the concepts are exactly the same as for the the heat equation because it's the same equation basically. So we will not go into that much uh, detail. We will immediately go to a more interesting situation um, if that thing allows. E. Yes. So we will go in the example folder and then. It's there is a capacitance computing example. We can just copy paste all that up. All right, and then we don't need this guy anymore. Um, so let's first see um, what is the the geometry. It's all prepared, right? So um, we can open it with gmesh capacitor dot mesh. We can open the mesh immediately because it's already available. So that's the mesh. Um, I can even no. I well, let me change the color because uh, I'm not sure how easily you can view it. And then I set the visibility. Sometimes Gmesh doesn't want to show the line, so you have to tick the visibility line. And then uh, let's see what regions we have. So we have four regions. So we have the we have a dielectric part. So it's a two D model again so you have to imagine that it extends infinitely long in the in the in the depth 
we have the dielectric and then on top of that we have air and then we have two physical regions that are lines we have an electrode and we have the ground so that's electrode and ground uh, and then you want to compute the capacitance of, of this system so between the electrode and the ground uh, given that you have a dielectric in between and you have air above it. So this will include uh, the fringing effect. So if you want to compute a capacitance, of course, you have this uh, parallel plate capacitance formula, which will give you a good approximation. It can be like more or less accurate. But in this case, um, since the, the plate is actually not so long, the distance between them is quite large. You might you will have, I think, if I remember well, 20% uh, change um, because of the fringing fields, so on the sides, uh, compared to the parallel plate capacitance. So we have, if you remember now, uh, region one, two, and three, and four, um, and then we will we will go through that main file that is already written. It's not too long, uh, but I will not write it live here. So we start again with a. Uh, uh, the electric, wait, that trick just uh, so we don't have to work with numbers one, two, three, four. We just uh, we can actually use it as text names. So the dielectric uh, physical region is one. So all the triangles in the mesh that are in the dielectric have that tag one associated, and all the air elements in the mesh have that tag two associated. And then electrode is the the, the top line. It has tag three, and ground is the bottom line that has tag four. Uh, we just load the, the capacitor mesh um, in, in, in the mesh object. And then this means that the, well, the, the mesh is available to everything after. So you never re reuse in, in this script the mesh object. But when you do this, it's just available in some, well, to talk in C++ terms, it's available in a, in a namespace that is the universe. And now everyone is aware of the existence of this mesh file. Um, so this is how all the other objects uh, can can have access to that, uh, even though you don't actually provide the mesh object to them. And then, uh, well, we have to find the dielectric in the air, but uh, we will define equations on everywhere. Um, and so it, it will be convenient to use uh, a new region that is everything. So that will be the union of the dielectric in the air. So that's what we do in this slide. And then we have our uh, electric potential field V. It's the same equations as for the temperature. So we're going to use also the H1 shape functions. And uh, well, why would we use order one if we can be more accurate with order two or three? Um, so for that, maybe a very little uh, method, like explanation of the convergence rate of a finite element. So if you assume you have a, a quadrangle with a, a, a structured mesh and uh, the number of uh, of uh, elements in the x and y direction is is kind of it's it's known, and you can put a number on this dimension that is h, which quantifies how many elements you have in each uh, x and y direction. Um, and then if you refine the mesh by splitting, so then you have in each direction two times more elements. Then suddenly your mesh size number h uh, becomes divided by two, right? So that's one thing. Um, and then P is usually called uh, uh, the polynomial order of uh, that you use on each element. So for piecewise linear, linear elements, you have uh, P is 1. Here we use order 3, so P is 3. And then finite element converges as, uh, well, asymptotically for a fine enough mesh, at least. Uh, it converges as H to the power P plus 1. So this means that if you refine your mesh, um, if you have order one, so p equal one, then you have h to the power two. So this means that if you refine your mesh by splitting in, in two in all directions, then you will kind of get a four times uh, more accurate solution at order one. But if you use order three, then, um, well, you get h to the power four. So you get a 16 times more accurate solution uh, when you refine by a factor two. Um, at least asymptotically. Uh, so yeah, you 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 become accurate much faster, at least for smooth problems. And asymptotically, I repeat again, if you have singularities, it's another story. 
But so at order three, you you will not need a, a mesh with one million degrees of freedom to be accurate to machine precision. Um, but at order one, you probably will have to have that. So um, going into high order is usually, uh, at least for smooth problem, it, it leads you to get a much better accuracy at, in the end, a much lower computational cost. Now, of course, there is always a trade-off, but um, well, no one uses, for example, order one shape functions for mechanics. You rather go for order two. And for wave problems, you might want to use order three. Here we will use order three because uh, why not? All right. So um, then we have to set conditions. So V, uh, it's uh, we're just using it as grad grad. So if you add a constant value to V, it's still a good solution. So uh, you have an infinite number of solutions or your problem is in theory singular. Uh, so you have to set uh, some uh, constraints. Uh, so we're going to set on the ground a zero constraint. So we will force the field V to zero on the ground. Uh, so this is exactly equivalent to this, but because it's zero uh, by default, you don't have to write it. Sparse lizard understands that it's zero. Um, and then you, you have to define the permittivity. Um, so this is the analog of the of the um, thermal conductivity. So in the previous case, it was uniform over the whole uh, region. But in, in our case now, um, we will make it, uh, we will change it between the air and the dielectric. So on the air, we have the, the, like the vacuum permittivity basically. And in the dielectric, we have 3.9 times more. So the way you do that is you define a parameter and then you can set the value of that parameter on different regions. So are you still there? I'm afraid we will be cut after one hour. I don't think so, but are you at least still there now? Hello? Yes, we are here. Ah, all right, thank you. So um, yeah, so the parameter allows you to work with epsilon as if it was uh, like a continuous quantity, you don't have to worry about what is the value on each part. Otherwise, you would have to write equations for the air and for the dielectric. Now, this is all stored in epsilon, and, and this syntax is very close to math, allows you to set the the, the parameter on, on each region. Now, you have no limit if you want to include other fields, like something that depends on the temperature. You can use it just like that. There is no limitation on that. Um, it's just any expression on the right side. All right, and then, uh, well, let's skip the port part for now. We'll come back in two minutes on it. Let's first see the equations. Uh, and this is also port related. So let's just talk about this thing. So um, it's, if we recall the equations, uh, we have this minus epsilon grad grad on the whole region omega. Um, and this is what we have on the whole region all we have this minus epsilon grad grad. That's the equation. Now we don't have uh, charge densities because we're gonna actually um, work with a forcing potential. So uh, what you, you could add a charge density term if you want to add like charges floating in the dielectric, you could do that. We, we don't have charges in the dielectric here. Um, what we do have is charges uh, on the electrodes. And for that, uh, we have seen before that you can use, um, well, you can, if you know the local uh, value of your Neumann term, you can just impose it like this. But this is not very practical. Um, sometimes you just know like how much total heat is coming in, how much total current is flowing in your, in your, in your geometry. And in this case, how much is the total charge on your on your electrode or what is the total voltage? And, and if you would do that, you would then get the total charge. So you want to work with more, uh, well, global quantities, uh, which is called your ports. Uh, so the ports are are just, um, so V and Q, it's a primal and dual port. Um, so this is now a bit more advanced, but I think it's still quite uh, easy to understand without understanding how it's actually implemented. But your V port, you will set it. So on, on this electric potential field, you will set a port on the electrode and you will set the primal and dual port. The V will be value of the electric potential on the whole electrode. 
So that means that now you have replaced all the degrees of freedom on the electrode by just one. And that's the value of capital V. It's the port V. And, and the dual port that corresponds is the total contribution of all the Neumann terms on that electrode. So it's still using exactly the principle that we have discussed before, but now in a, in a like total contribution form. So if we come back to the equations, well, the Neumann term is this epsilon normal derivative of V. And if you make a micro cut on the electrode, um, then you can actually check that the integral on the whole like micro cutted electrode region um, actually this is the, it will give you the total charge that is on the electrode, uh, right? Because of this term, um, when you integrate it on overall, uh, over the like uh, very thin slice of surface around the electrode, you get the total charge. So if you lump your field V on the electrode, you get uh, access to port V. Um, that's just the feeder of sparse lizard that is, and then, and then dual port will give you the total contribution on that region of the Neumann term, which is the total charge. So it's just a different way to interact with uh, the Neumann term in a more uh, global way. And then once you have defined these two ports, um, you, you can yeah, set it on the electrode, primal dual port, and then you can assign, you can add electric equations or any, any constant parameter equation for now or you can simply assign the value of the charge on the electrode. You could also assign the value of the electric potential. And then after solving, you would get the total charge. So you can do one or the other. It doesn't matter here because we're interested in the total capacitance. And then after solving, actually, if you have supplied Q as 0.1 nanocoulomb total charge on the electrode, then you can take the value you have after the resolution, you have the dual port, so V, which is the, the corresponding port, port to Q. So this is the primal port. You can get its value. It's available after resolution. Um, and this is the lumped electrode uh, voltage. So it's constant on all the electrode. And, and you can get the value. You have the value of the total charge. And then you can just, by dividing, you get the capacitance um, very accurately. Um, now, if you provide a uh, but again, well, we will do it numerically. So you have the capacitance, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, you get a way to compute accurately capacitances. We print the capacitance out, the voltage on the on the on the electrode, and uh, and then the field V and uh, epsilon, uh, the electric field, which is minus grad V. We also print it out, and then this is just a validation line for checking that the code still runs correctly. Uh, when I make changes, so we can we can run that. Uh, no, there we go. And then we will visualize this time in Gmesh. All right, so you it computes the, the capacitance and uh, and you also get the electrode voltage. Now, if I would put V minus oh, one volt, for example, then I would uh, not force the total charge, I would force the total voltage. Um, and then what I would get is still the same capacitance because the charge and the voltage, well, they scale with each other. So we would still have the same uh, capacitance, but now my electrode voltage would be one volt. So you can do it the way you want. Um, in this case, it doesn't matter. Let's keep it as it was. Uh, originally, and then let's visualize the electric field and V, and then basically we will be done. So um, we can open all the pass files. All right, and then uh, well, the we can probably also overlay the um, quad. No, not the the capacitor. Geo. So you have the dielectric below. You have uh, your electric potential. And uh, yeah, uh, so that's it. You have your voltage on the electrode and then, uh, well, basically you have zero on the ground and then you will see that the electric field is uh, mostly concentrated between the 
I can probably change the scale because we don't see anything on that. If I put it logarithmic, it's much better. So, um, yeah, so as expected, your electric field, well, it, it goes like from the electrode to the ground. Um, like, obviously, it's much stronger, but it's logarithmic scale, but it's much stronger um, between the electrode and the ground. So this is the part that you would capture with the parallel plate um, equation. Um, but but then there is much more to that because you have the fringing fields on, on the left um, and on the right of the electrode. And this actually increases your um, your capacitance. Um, so this is like the actual capacitance without parallel plate approximation. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, that's about it. Is there any question? Hello. Any question or otherwise just say no, so we don't keep on waiting, but uh... no, no questions from my end. Uh, I could have a question about the dual port. Uh, port yes. Yes. Yeah, like how it's, well, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to ask how it's implemented, but like how it's, uh, let's say in the, in the, in the code here, in the script, how it's evaluated. Like how it's evaluated, say, but yeah, when you say yeah. port VN cube and you say then and the electrode, yeah. So, so basically, um, if you if you don't put this line, then the formulation is absolutely not aware of the port. But if you put this line, then the formulation adds the degrees of freedom for Q and and V is added anyways because it's part of. Uh, of this guy. So when you add this line, really, uh, the formulation is aware of the VQ port pair. Uh, so um, this means that the number of degrees of freedom here will be lower because the all the DOFs on the on the electrode are now lumped to only one. And one degree of freedom for Q is added to the structure of the unknowns in the in the in the formulation. So you have your matrix A, X, B. Um, they will be uh, one more uh, the B, for example, will be one longer because there's one unknown adding added for Q. And then when you solve it, well, you just have Q and V available in the solution AX equal B, so in X. And then in this, um, well, in this solve, you generate, you solve, and you save the, the solution to the fields, but also to the ports. So the last step saves the solution X to the fields, so V is updated. But also um, the Q is saved because it's part of the unknowns. There is a value in the X solution. It's saved to the corresponding port Q. And so uh, the value of Q has been updated. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Is there any other question? Is there some difference in in the line port B and Q if you replace it just like double B and Q? Why is it named port? Uh, wait, uh, do you mean like two times Q when you... Before you say B set port electrode B and Q. Yes. You yes. B and Q. Why are they? Yes. Uh, what's the motivation for introducing them as ports? They are just couples. Yes, they are couples. Yes. Well, the motivation is a uh, is user friendliness and its simplicity. Can I say? Uh, yep, but maybe let's. Uh, like, the sentence is not double P plus plus sentence. Wait, uh, speak up because our uh, people, we have uh, your uh, quite a lot of noise and I cannot hear you right now. Then. Uh, I'm With, saying yeah. means 
But uh, I mean, uh, Timo, uh, if you could just uh, quickly stop your microphone because it adds a lot of noise. Um. Uh, I think Timo means yeah. Thank you. For VNQ is not double like in C plus plus syntax. It's port. So. All right, you would use doubles. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, uh, so that's what it, like uh, because. Uh, I, I, I guess Timo can confirm is if that was the question, but uh, that that's it. Okay, if that's the question, but then yes, okay. Uh, it, basically, uh, it's just yeah, you cannot use doubles in C plus plus because then uh, I I need a I need a tag to I understand now the question. Uh, if you do double VQ, then uh, well you. You have no reference, then it's just like if we would put 1.3 here. In terms of uh, C++ programming, I, I I don't know anything about. I, I cannot keep track of 1.3, right? Uh, it has to. There should be some. So the way it's implemented is that when you have a port, actually it creates a raw port, and so a port is just a storage for a pointer. And so when you manipulate the port, the pointer value is available at all times. And so this allows you to uniquely uh, identify the port in the unknown structure. So when you're speaking of Q here, it actually just carries a pointer. Uh, and actually it's a shared pointer. And so um, it never changes the pointer that is carried. And so I can always uniquely identify it to that uh, that port because if I would just use a double, I don't have that option. Um, I need to have some structure that I create on my own to be able to uniquely identify this. Otherwise, it's exactly like if I would put one point three. I cannot use it as an unknown because I I, I need so if, if I use Q here, I know which pointer it is, and if I reuse Q here, I know which pointer it is, and I can store that. It does does that make sense? But I don't have that option with a double. Okay, I, I understand. It's just like a layer of making it a pointer for doubles or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. If we, I, I can actually just uh, like. Oh no, I cannot do it because I have the static library. But I could otherwise. If you go to the port object on the source code on GitHub, you will see that it's just carrying a row point pointer. But uh, yeah, good question. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, are you, could you cut the microphone? Oh yeah, thanks. Any other question? Or if you at least get show that you're still alive. So, if there is no more other question, maybe uh, wait five more seconds. But if there is no more other question, then I can just say goodbye and see you hopefully at the next um, at the next uh, mini lecture. That the topic is still to be decided. Uh, see you next lecture. Yes. Bye bye. Um, then if the if the so you will manage the the recording, I guess you can get stop it now. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for this.